today in our first meeting together we'll speak about the method of getting into Buddhism for the sake of simplicity speed and efficiency in coming to terms with Buddhism we'd like you to begin by knowing three words the first word is is rock rule we could say comprehensive knowledge or complete knowing the second is to be awake to be wide awake fully awake the third is book ban which is like to blossom like a flower blossoming in freshness purity clarity so please know these three words three words comprehensive knowing to be fully awake and to blossom Con comprehensive knowing here does not mean knowing everything it means merely to know the things we need to know so it's to know comprehensively everything that is necessary for us to know it really isn't necessary for us to know about all the matters of outer space or the inner workings of the the atom of, of nucleus there are many things that aren't really necessary for us to know but there are things that if we know them they will lead to the direct and complete end of suffering of of pain these are the things that it is necessary for us to know as for the word to be fully awake to wake up this doesn't mean so much to physically be awake but it's when the mind wakes up from the sleep of of the human defilements of greed anger and delusion to wake up from these is what we mean here by waking up to be asleep to be lost in greed anger in delusion is to be lost in darkness and to wake up from that is the second thing we're we're talking about if there is knowing and there is waking up then there will be a blossoming like a flower blossoms but this will be a blossoming that that will not wilt ordinary flowers blossom and then wilt and rot but this blossoming because it comes from knowing and from waking up from the defilements this blossoming into freshness and clarity doesn't wilt so now we come to what we call Buddha Sasana or Buddhism first of all we'd like to say that Buddhism will not harm or interfere with with your intellectual or cultural freedom you all are free to think and believe and hold opinions as you say fit depending on your cultural educational or religious background this intellectual freedom is not tampered with by Buddhism so there is no need to stop being a Christian a Muslim or whatever Buddhism can still provide something of value because the methods of Buddhism have nothing to do with interfering with our freedom of thought belief and expression instead Buddhism has something to add some methods or points of view or ways of ob observation which will help us to 
to, to find the way to free our lives from suffering, to eliminate, to quench suffering in our lives, or we can say, will help us to eliminate problems from our lives. So you can see if you, that in Buddhism there is no dogmatic system. Buddhism doesn't force you to believe anything, to study or practice. Buddhism does not require any belief in any system of dogma. Rather, Buddhism encourages you to think for yourself, study for yourself, investigate things on your own. And when you come across things that you think will be able to quench suffering, to get rid of pain and, and sorrow, then go ahead and experiment. Try those things out. And only when you know directly through your own experience, through your own living, that something will eliminate suffering, only then need you believe it. You need not rely on any system of dogma. Sometimes we have difficulties with the words we use. And so there are often people asking, is this Buddhism a, rig a religion or not? So it comes down to how we look at and how we use these words. And if we understand the word religion in a profound way, then we will see also that Buddhism is a religion. So we ask you to consider the following meaning or definition of religion. This is the one that seems most appropriate to us. Religion is the practices or the system of practices that enable mankind to, to realize the highest thing, the practices which lead humanity to the highest thing. To us, this is the correct and clearest definition of religion. But then we would, there's a lot of wondering about this thing called the highest thing. In religions that believe in God or some form or kind of God, they will hold that God is the highest thing. In Buddhism, however, we do not say that God is the highest thing. Rather, we say that Nibbana is the highest, the supreme thing. Nibbana is this state where all suffering is completely quenched, completely ended, where the state in which all problems are dropped, are eliminated. This complete ending of suffering, of misery, is what we call Nibbana. Now if you would like to talk about God in relation to Buddhism, then you would have to do it in terms of Nibbana, which would mean it's a non-personal God. Nibbana has nothing to do with a person with an, some individual-like thing. But if we wish to call it a non-personal God, we could do so. This, in Buddhism, is the highest thing, the supreme thing. <clears throat> Buddhism is a way of practice that enables us to reach, to realize this highest thing. Now, if you prefer, even if you prefer to, to continue using, to use the word God, God in the name Yahweh, or God in the name of Allah, or whichever name God has, we, we suggest that you give, understand this name with the meaning of that which helps us to salvation that which helps us to be saved. The thing that will really help us to be saved from all pain, all misery, all suffering, all dukkha. This is the, the meaning we suggest for you. And if we can use this meaning, 
then there will be no disagreement and no conflict between us. The word Nibbana as a verb means the, the action, the activity that completely extinguishes and eliminates suffering and misery. And then the result of that is the state, the fruit of, of coolness in which there is no pain and misery. This is just as much a god as any of the other gods because this is the highest thing, this, this act, action which helps us to be free of all misery. This is the non-personal god. But if you'd like, we can use all the gods, all the different names of God to help us in order to be saved from the, the great torment of suffering, of misery. There's no need for us to argue about God. There's no reason to turn God into a, an argument or something to fight about. Why not just use all the gods in order to help us to realize the highest thing, complete freedom from suffering. We can, we can compare religions if we wish, but we should never do so in a way that leads to conflict and argument. If we, we study comparative religions, we should do so not to emphasize the differences but to find the similarities, find the places where we can cooperate and work together. If we compare religions in this way, it can be a fruitful and useful activity. So we should look and see that all religions aim to, aim to eliminate selfishness from human life. That all religions, all true religions, are trying to bring peace into the world, to allow peace to flourish and spread. These are the aims of all religions. Now, different religions may use different methods, have different terminologies, different symbols, in order to bring about these, these aims. But this is merely to, to as ways to try and help the many different kinds of people coming from many different cultures and backgrounds. The different, the great variety in religion is just to answer and respond to the great variety in humans and in the needs of humans. But always religions are trying to bring peace, to allow peace to flourish. If we can see this, then there's no need for argument. And we can, we can use this basic essence of religion to our advantage as we see that all religions work to eliminate suffering, to completely destroy suffering in human lives. The words being united with God, being one with God, mean the state or the condition of being completely free of suffering, of having quenched misery. This is what it means to be united with God. Whether you say God or Nibbana or whatever, whether you say this is the personal God or the non-personal God or whatever we call it, the true meaning that we're talking about is being completely free of having eliminated pain, misery, or as we say in, in Pali, eliminating dukkha, having quenched dukkha. This is what it really means to be united with God, to have realized this, this state. When we see that all, all the religions are pointing to this, this same thing, then there's no need for conflict. When we see that this, all religions are pointing to this state that is free of pain, misery, in conflict, then we see that there's simply one method involved in religion, and then that one method or way 
is the way that gets rid of suffering. The fact that some religions in some places prefer to talk about a God that is personal, a God that has individual, sometimes even human characteristics. This, this is so because in some places and times it is that religion saw that there was, it was not possible to talk to people about a God that was non-personal. And so when people wouldn't understand such a thing, it is necessary to speak about the highest thing in terms of a personal, individual God. But in some times and places, people can understand. They're ready to, to listen ab to and practice towards a non-personal God, a God completely free of any personality traits or human characteristics. Buddhism is of the later sort. When people are able to comprehend this teaching, then Buddhism will discuss the non-personal God, will point out that there is such a thing, that this is the highest, the supreme thing, and will encourage people to practice in order to reach this highest non-personal God. So let's just say that whatever will make us be above our problems, what, whatever enables us to be above all problems, that is God. Whether it's a non-personal or a personal God, we won't worry about. But let's just pay attention to this thing that allows us to be above our problems, to be above all pain and misery. Now let's talk about Buddhism specifically. Buddhism is able to show us or teach us a new way or a new system of life. Of life. Buddhism will give us the means to, to follow a new system of life. When we say this we mean that Buddhism will allow us to live life in a way that is completely free of all positivism and negativism. It'll allow us to get out of the traps that positive thinking and negative thinking build for us. This is to be completely free, to be free of any influence of any of the power of the positive and the negative. Now many people will not be interested by this because nowadays people are in love with the positive. They're infatuated by positivism, by positive things. And so many people will not be willing or not will be uninterested in what Buddhism has to offer. But if we really are interested in freedom, in peace and in truth, then Buddhism will help us to be free of the influences of positivism and negativism, of, of, of our minds being dominated by the positive and the negative. There's an absolute fact that anyone who is enslaved to positivism, anyone who is trapped by the positive that person will not like Buddhism. They won't be interested in Buddhism and will be unable to understand it. Because if we're completely trapped by the positive, if our mind is thoroughly dominated by thinking about what is positive, by what we like and want, then we won't be able to appreciate or understand Buddhism, which enables us to be free of positivism and negativism. This, this indulgence or infatuation with positivism can be traced to our attachment to the positive. There are things that we consider to be positive or sometimes we say good 
And we like these things, we want them, we desire them. And because of this liking and desiring of positive things, we get attached to the positive. We, we take up a personal attitude. We, we get involved in them personally. We take up an egoistic stance. And this we call attachment. And through this attachment to the positive, we become trapped by it. And through this trap, we are plunged into all kinds of frustration, sorrow, and misery. Anyone who is completely satisfied, or at least thinks that they are happy with indulgence and attachment to positivism, such a person will have no chance of understanding Buddhism. Buddhism is a method that is free of the influence of positivism and negativism. It's, it's outside of the sphere of influence of these attachments. And so Buddhism, the, and through correctly following, studying and practicing the principles of Buddhism, we can transcend the problem of negativism and positivism and the attaching to them. But if we still like, if we're still happy about indulgent, indulgence in positivism, then we will not be able to understand Buddhism as it really is. What we'll do is we'll just distort Buddhism to fit our own opinions and perspectives. But in fact, we will never even know what genuine Buddhism is, and it will be impossible that we would ever have actual, true Buddhism, unless, unless we are truly interested in freedom from the positive and the negative. If we don't, are not interested in this freedom, then we have no chance of understanding Buddhism. As for the, the negative, this really isn't so much of a problem because none of us are very interested in the negative as it is. We're all willing to do without it. So the negative or negativism isn't such a problem. But still, indirectly, it confronts us, so we will have to deal with, with it as well. Because negative things, negative thoughts, will come in even though we don't really want them. And so we'll have to know how to deal with them, how to be free of the negative as well. And so Buddhism will enable us to be free both of the positive and also the negative. And it will help us to arrange, to manage in our, our lives so that we can live our lives in a truly free and peaceful way. On unharmed and uninfluenced by, the, by positivism and negativism. Or to make it a little easier to, to understand, we can talk about another pair of words, the words good and evil or, or good and bad. The meaning of good and evil is basically the same as positivism and negativism. This good, our pursuit of the good, dominates our lives. We're always wanting something good, liking something good, chasing after something good. We hunger for the good and then suffer frustration or disappointment when we don't get it as soon and as quick enough or in large enough quantities or, or in exactly the form we want. Our pursuit of the good, our fixation and obsession with the good dominates us. And of course, there's always the bad. There are the bad, the evil things that come into our lives even though we don't want them. And so we're confronted with the bad. We're ordinary people are going back and forth between the good and the evil all the time. Buddhism allows us to be beyond the influence of these as well, to not have to live a life that is dominated and trapped within the good and the bad, but instead to be 
to be free of these, to transcend them. Those of you who have ever studied the Bible, the Christian Bible, might be familiar where, with the place in the first, chap the, the first chapter of Genesis where God, God tells Adam and Eve not to attach to good and evil. Don't get involved in good and evil. It'll just bring you lots of problems. This is the message of the story about the tree of the knowledge or the tree of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. There's that tree with the apples and if you eat one of the apples then you know about good and evil and it brings about all kinds of problems. This is the Bible's way of warning us to not attach to good and evil. This is the basic essence of spiritual life to be out from under this attachment so that our lives can be free. As human beings we create our problems for ourselves and the vast majority of these problems are created out of the good. Because of our obsession with the good, our desires and hungers for the good, we make ourselves all kinds of problems. We want the good, we're searching for it and chasing after the good. But when we get it, we're not even satisfied. We want a better good. But that isn't enough. And so we, we hope for, we work for, we search for the best good. But even the best good isn't enough for us. We always want more. Our, our desire for the good, this attachment to the good is endless. There's no, there's no stopping it. And it just goes on and on, going around in circles, chasing after the good, the better good, and the best good. This, this pursuit of the good causes us so many problems. The bad, of course, has some of its problems. But it's this, it's this, we volunteer, we're hungry for, we're in favor of the good, and so it causes the most problems. The same is true of positivism. Negativism isn't near, doesn't cause so many problems. To be free of this is what Buddhism is about. Because of this obsession with the good, we're unable to sleep at night. We even develop nervous disorders, psychoses, can go crazy, to the point that some people kill themselves because of this obsession with the good. Or if we put it in the most simple terms, when we're, when we're very happy, when we're really happy, we're unable to sleep at night and the food we eat doesn't taste good. Have, have you looked and seen this for yourself? Or when we're sad and unhappy, the food we eat doesn't taste good and we can't sleep properly at night. This shows very clearly the influence, the result of the good and the bad, of positivism and negativism and shows that the only place to be free and at peace is when we're no longer under the influence of good and bad, of positive and negative. Then we'll be able to sleep at night and food will taste delicious. For example, people who kill themselves. Generally, we love ourselves more than anything else. But some of us will go and kill this, this life that we love the most because we've gotten too attached to some form of goodness and then the result is suicide. Now our way to be free is to study and investigate things. It's to study and investigate specifically goodness and evil and see that these are products of our own minds and that the thing that causes goodness and evil, the source of goodness and evil is our own foolishness, our own ignorance. Because of this ignorance we go and discriminate things as good and evil. We, we evaluate things 
as positive and negative. In fact, things are just what they are. They're not just natural phenomena. They're just the way they are. But then we go and evaluate them, judge them from our own personal positions and prejudices as good and evil, positive and negative. So this is how our own ignorance turns things into problems when in fact they're just the way they are. This idea that they are good or bad is our own creation. It's something we put, we add to experience. It's not there in the first place. There's a very special word in Buddhism that captures the, the most profound essence of this, this teaching. So we'd like you to learn this word and to consider it, work with it, explore it, in order to get the most out of it. This word in, in very simple terms is just like that. Things are just like this. Or in the Pali language of the Buddha, we can say, Tathata, Tathata, Tathata. Or we can translate into English as thusness or suchness. Only thus, just merely thus. Things aren't good, they're not bad, positive or negative, or any of those other dualistic categories. They're merely thus. And this quality, this characteristic of thusness in all things, this is the essence of Buddhism. When we see things in this way, when we see the thusness, the suchness of, of things, of our own bodies and minds, then there is no more entrapment and slavery to goodness and badness. And then we are free. So please give a lot of consideration to this word da ta da da ta da see if you can understand it <coughs> and then experience it and then see the results of that experience we can use our knowledge about science to help us to understand these things we all have some background in the basics of science so for example we have on one side a picture which is not beautiful or ugly and over here we have a picture which is beautiful that's what we think this picture is beautiful and this one isn't but if we understand science then we can see things in a different way normally there would be this picture which is not beautiful we don't like it we don't want to look at it we don't want to have anything to do with it then there's this beautiful picture which we're attracted to. We might fall in love with it, get infatuated with it, try to buy it or steal it. But if we look at things scientifically, we see that both pictures are merely waves of light. Just little waves with bundles of photon energy, of light energy, coming and striking the retina of our eye. That's all that is. In this way, both pictures are the same, merely rays of light, waves of light. They're also somewhat different, the exact makeup and frequency of the light waves, the amplitude and so forth may be different, but fundamentally it's merely the same waves of light. But some people go and discriminate this pattern, this this pattern of light waves is beautiful and this pattern is not beautiful whereas other people would discriminate it in a different way so fundamentally it's just merely there's this basic thusness of the things in these these light waves we can see this even more clearly if we compare it with a dog you take a picture that human beings consider beautiful and show it to a dog and the dog doesn't even care. There is no absolute beauty or non-beauty in the thing. It's something that we create ourselves. These are, these are conceptual thoughts that we attach or apply to the reality. Both pictures have the same fundamental thusness, 
They're just the way they are. They're just thus. But then we go and conceptualize. We discriminate this goodness and badness or beauty and non-beauty upon these pictures when fundamentally there is no such thing. It's our own ignorance evaluating and judging and confusing the situation. We can take an example having to do with sound. There are sounds that we consider pleasant and other sounds which are unpleasant. There are beautiful, harmonious sounds and there are obnoxious, ugly sounds. But if we examine them scientifically, we'll see that really all there is are sound waves. There are just waves of sound. They're just there's differences in these different waves, but basically it's just sound waves. And these different sound waves don't really have any meaning or any special quality. But when they strike the, the eardrums and then are interpreted by the brain and then the mind, the mind, once it receives this sound, then it gives them meaning, it gives them qualities. The mind conjures up the beauty or the unpleasantness, the harshness or the softness, the, the harmoniousness or the discordancy. This the mind attaches to the experience. And then this, these different kinds of sound become problems for the mind, things to get and things to get rid of. And so the mind turns these ordinary sound waves into problems. If we just see the thusness, if we see that it's merely just different kinds of sound waves and see the thusness of the situation, then it won't lead to any problems. To see the da ta da, the thusness of these sound waves enables us to be free of the influence of the sound. And then no sounds will ever cause problems for us. As long as we continue judging and evaluating them, sound will be a problem for us. But if we see the thusness of the sound waves, then we are above the influence, influence of beautiful sounds, unpleasant sounds, of all sounds. And so no sound will ever create a problem for us again. Or we can look at the, the tongue and the flavors or tastes experienced by the tongue. Ordinarily we would discriminate between delicious and bad tasting or foul tastes and flavors. But really it's just a matter of ver the amount of things stimulating the, the taste buds and the nerves within the tongue. There's a very limited number of, of taste buds in the tongue or in types. And so the taste, the taste, the flavor of things is determined by the quantity of stimulation of the taste buds and nerves within the tongue. And depending on if the taste buds are stimulated in one way, it's, it's sweet, and another way is sour, and another way is bitter. If we see that the so-called flavors and the things we take to be delicious and foul tasting are merely just a matter of the degree of stimulation of the taste buds. If we see this thusness of the flavors, then we won't be trapped into these conceptualizing things as delicious or as foul. We do this on our own. We add these ideas to it. There's just this basic sense activity and then we judge it and attach to it and turn it into problems. But if we see the thusness of this activity in the tongue, we see that these so-called flavors are, are merely thus. They're just this thusness, this da ta da Then the tastes won't be a source of problems and torment for us anymore. There's also the nose and the various odors that are experienced by the nose. Generally, we, we say that some are fragrant, 
and other are, are that others smell bad, have a rotten, foul odor to them. These various aromas, whether fragrant or or rotten, are also supplied by us. If we look carefully, we'll see that really it's just a matter of the amount of volatile gases making contact with the nose. There are these kinds of gases which, which come into the nose and then react with the nose. And if there's a lot of these, if these odors are intense, we tend to feel that they smell bad, that they're unpleasant, bad-smelling, foul odors. But often, if they're not so strong, we may, we may judge them to be fragrant and pleasant. And so it comes down to this pleasant and unpleasant odors, good and bad smelling odors, are merely a subject of the intensity or the amount of the volatile gases entering the nose. This is the thusness about the nose, but generally we don't see this. And so we, we attach to and get involved and react to what is taken to be what is taken to be fragrant or a bad odor. You can, you can test this for yourself. You can go and take a very strong, foul-smelling thing that you find really obnoxious. And if you put it in a place where the, the odor can disperse, at first it's very intense and very annoying. It smells really bad. But if we allow it to disperse and to, to spread out, to fade a bit, that what was once a very foul odor can actually become a pleasant, fragrant odor. They do this with women's perfumes. They take really obnoxious things and then put them in a certain quantity so we actually think that they smell good. And we can test this for ourselves. If we understand that this, the nose and smells are basically just this interaction between volatile gases in the nose, then we won't be trapped into judging these odors and reacting to them and being dominated by them. This is the value of seeing the, the thusness of the nose and the, the odors in order to be free of them. You probably won't believe us but it's a fact that if you take a corpse, a rotting, stinking, dead body, which f smells really horrible and foul, if you take the corpse and allow its odor to fade, to s disperse and spread out, either through being through distance or in time, if we allow that odor of the corpse to fade sufficiently, that smell will actually become pleasant. You may not believe this, but this is how it works. This is a very good example of the, the way the senses trick us. Because of the foolishness of all this, because the lack of knowledge and intelligence, because we don't understand how these work, we're always judging these things as good and bad, as pleasant and unpleasant, and we're liking and disliking and reacting all the time because we don't see the thusness, the data da of these things. We don't see what's actually taking place. We just follow the foolish activity of our senses and get tricked by them. And then because of this trickery, we do all kinds of things. But if we see the data da of the, of odors, of the, the, or actually the quantity of volatile gases, <clears throat> or tastes, the amount of stimulation of the taste buds, <clears throat> or the sound waves, or the light waves. If we see the da 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 of these things, then there won't be any problems. None of these things will do us any damage. They won't, they won't trick us into doing anything foolish. There are many examples of the da da da, of these basic aspects of our life. If we study them, if we explore them, 
investigate them carefully, then the knowledge from doing so will enable us to be free. And we'll see that there's really no good or bad. There's no bad and good. There's no positive and negative. These are all creations of our mind when we're tricked by the senses. If we see this da ta da and see through all these labels and concepts that we're, we're attaching to life, then we be, can become more and more free and our lives more peaceful. So let's, we can ramp thing up, things up by saying, through the knowledge of da ta da we'll see through all the, all the apparent or delusive dualities in life. All the different dualities such as as beautiful and ugly, as delightful and displeasing, of smelling good and smelling bad, and deliciousness and foul tasting, and all these other dualities that can be summarized as good and bad, or positive and negative. Da ta da enables us to see through all these dualities so that life is above and beyond the power where, of these things, where they have no more ability to condition and concoct and dominate our minds. In order to be free of these things, we'd like to encourage you to explore and practice anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing in and breathing out. Through practicing anapanasati correctly, wisely, then we will, we, will, we will come to the understanding and realization of the datata of all aspects of our lives and of this world in which we live. And so we encourage you to apply yourselves to the practice of anapanasati so that it will lead to you seeing the datata the thusness of your own bodies and minds of your own lives. And in this way, your life will be free of all problems, of all misery, of all dukkha. And so we'll end today's talk at this point. We hope you're successful in practicing anapanasati.